The narrative of human life has been marked by major turning points, altering the course of civilization for the better. Arthur Thomas Cahill calls them the hinges of history and has embarked on a seven-volume series celebrating their story. The first installment, How the Irish Saved Civilization, has been on the New York Times bestseller list for over a year and a half. It is followed by his latest book, The Gifts of the Jews, How a Tribe of Desert Nomads Changed the Way Everyone Thinks and Feels. And I am pleased to have him on this broadcast, having missed him uh, when he told the story of how the Irish saved civilization. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. It's Pleasure to, to be here. here. Uh, tell me just the idea to do this, where it came from. Uh, it came uh, in Ireland about 28 years ago. I attended something called Puck Fair, which was uh, 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 a sort of orgy, actually. It was a remnant of a prehistoric <laughs> fertility festival. And I thought I would always, I always thought I'd like to visit an orgy. And uh, when I got there, I found it very strange, very alien. And I began to think, I was a, much younger than I am now, and I began to think um, about uh, the past in a new way. Um, I had luckily a very good classical education and I had already come in contact with the Greek and Roman classics and I had always thought they were a little strange and suddenly this all seemed to come together and I realized that the West was very different even though it had these tucked away sort of cyclical pagan celebrations of, of the seasons and of fertility from a much earlier time that we were very different people and I began to think about that seriously so that really both of the first books in this series, both the book about the Irish and the book about the Jews, started with that first experience. How are we very different people? All ancient societies basically viewed the world in the same way. Uh, all ancient societies were cyclical. And every humanities course you've ever taken or philosophy course will make reference to the cyclical worldview. And no one ever explains what it is. The cyclical worldview is a fatalistic view in which you imagine that everything happens over and over again. The past repeats itself, and you are not really an individual. You're just a sort of cog in the wheel of life and death. Right. Uh, so it's summer, fall, winter, spring, birth, copulation, death, over and over again. The Jews were the first people to break out of this worldview, and they did it more or less, we think, 4,000 years ago with the vocation of Abraham, who is told by God to leave the place that he is in, to leave his father's house, and set off for the unknown. And this is incredibly strange in this ancient context. No one had ever had an adventure. The word adventure in all ancient societies means catastrophe, something that befalls you that you wish hadn't happened. Right. A misadventure, in other words, in our, word, in our language. Abraham sets off and he doesn't know where he's going, and he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. And for the first time, the future is not the same old thing, but actually something new, something surprising, something never before known. And that's the beginning of our sense of history, of time, and of future. Just one moment about the Jews and then come back to the broader picture. Is that why you have the subtitle, How Tribe of Desert Nomads Changed the Way Everyone Thinks and Feels? For that very reason. Yes, and I think it's in, the feels is very important. You know, this is not merely philosophy. It's not merely ideas. Um, you, I can say, well, that's interesting. Is that what you think? You know? Yeah. But what do you really feel? That gets much more deeply into a person. So that what I'm trying to do in the hinges of history is to tell the story of the development of the sensibility of the Western world. Sensibility, I think, is a good word. It combines both intellect, <laughs> it combines head and heart. Right, right. It has both things together. Irish are one, Jews are another. What are the other five? I'm not talking while the uh, flavor lasts. I, uh -huh. um, I uh, you know, uh, it, it was that but same, let me tell you, that same summer that, <laughs> I, that uh, I went to the uh, festival in Ireland, I remember sitting in a, in a pub in the west of Ireland on a bar stool and there was a guy next to me and uh, after a little conversation I finally said to him, what do you do? And he said, I, I'm a writer. And I said, oh, what have you written? And he said, well, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a bad way of talking. Yeah. I think that a writer should only talk about what he's written. And I find also when I begin to write, 
everything changes. And then finally, so it may not be seven, it may be eight, it may be six. And they certainly may not, may not come out in the way in which I'm thinking of them right now. All right, but this has been in the print, so I'm going to just have to ask you this. Is one of these anticipated, obviously it has to be, one of the anticipated volumes has to do with the life of Jesus? Uh, yes. yes, yes. And what would and it be like to meet probably. him at his time, in his that's time? That's right, that's right. right. That's sure. one of them. Right. Okay, and so I'm down, people, so I'm now five to four. Let's get at the other four. And I'll four. tell you that one is going to be about the Greeks, and that's the Greek. as far okay, as I'll go. Okay, that's three. So we, we, <laughs> because people we've only say, got three to go here. Let's figure. Right. Where do the Romans fit into this? Ah, the Romans that's, aren't so important, and they keep coming in so and important? out. They're not so important? Well, if you read the, uh, the How the Irish Saved Civilization, you, the first two chapters are about Rome. Yeah. So the, the Romans will kind of keep making guest appearances. <laughs> of, uh, a, the Romans are part of the Irish experience. Is that well, your definition? Well, the way definition? I set it up, I guess. <laughs> Not really, but they, they, we begin in Rome and then we go to Ireland. So we begin with the fall of Rome and, and we recapitulate Roman history in the first yeah. two chapters. So When do we get the Egyptians in? Oh, well, they're not really part of the West. <laughs> they'll, they'll be a kind of subset of the Greeks. Yeah, okay, when Alexander went to <laughs> right. Egypt, that becomes right. part of the Egyptian story. But very often people say, what do you mean the Jews started all of this? I know I you want to get back the to Greeks, the Jews, don't you? you know? I know. <laughs> and I always say, well, the Greeks were still in diapers when the, the Jews were thinking all yeah. of these thoughts and having all these experiences. And that really is true. Abraham brings us back almost four millennia ago. So Abraham becomes one of the great people of of one of the time. major, one of the, the, he's the granddaddy of them all. He's the father of the Jewish people, and that's, that means a great deal. What do we know about him? We know about him on, pretty much only what is in the book of Genesis. We know a few extra things that we've been able to come up with from archaeology, from, from comparative right. culture, but basically the, what we know about him, more than the later figures, is simply what is in the Bible. But what is in the Bible is so interesting because the early... The early stories in Genesis, like Adam and Eve and the flood, are obviously uh, fables mm -hmm. of some kind. Uh, we come to Abraham, and it's a completely different kind of writing. You realize that this is the first attempt to actually write history, to try to say what happened. To document Abraham. Yes, because this is the story of the forefathers. We have to, we are who we are. We have come to this moment because they came to their moments. And it is very important to go backward in time and to tell the story of the past. Do you think <laughs> that the Jews have been given credit for their contribution? Absolutely not. Why not? I think there are a whole lot of reasons. One set of reasons. And what haven't they been given credit for? What, uh, one set of reasons is, that, <clears throat> is the history of education. Uh, education in the West comes out of the classical world. It comes out of the Greco-Roman world. So that if you look at the early Middle Ages, for instance, if you look at the story in How the Irish Saved Civilization, which is about the early Middle Ages, you see that what they were doing was dealing with Latin and Greek. That as far as they knew, that was what you needed in order to be educated. So that Latin and Greek and those histories and those figures become the center in many ways of Western education. The Jews were in the Bible. That was like a special thing. Off on, that was something that you read in church. They never entered the world of education in the same way. Uh, but I would say that, for instance, an easy way of looking at it would be that the Greeks gave us the form of Western civilization, but the Jews gave us the content. They the gave content. us the, the values, substance. The, the substance. Values. The, 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 the Greeks gave us the filing cabinet into which we file our various categories, yeah. but the Jews actually gave us the things that really matter to us, uh, like the future and the future holding promise, the idea that what I do in the present actually begins to create the future, the idea that you are an individual, not just an instance of uh, the zodiac, that each of us is actually an individual that our coming together is the coming together of two separate destinies that for a few minutes at least have something to do with one another. The idea of individual destiny, the idea of my being open to the future, to, my, to, to the possibility of freedom, of my own personal freedom because I make choices in the present that actually affect what happens next. These are all new ideas and we carry them without even thinking about them, whether we're Jew or Christian 
or a atheist in the West, everyone has these ideas. And why were the Jews this way? That's an awfully good question, Charlie. Um, and I don't think anyone could answer it in a way that would satisfy an academic historian. Um, I say toward the end of the book that if you were ever to find God in human affairs, you would have to find him in this story because what the Jews came up with is so bizarre, so unusual. Bizarre, unusual. For what came, as against what came earlier, because it is such, it, it, th these ideas are in a way the only new ideas that ever entered Western or human consciousness. Before the Jews, everyone thought the same way and gradually Western ideas have influenced the whole world, but before that influence occurred, you actually had everyone believing in a cyclical universe, everyone believing in a polytheistic universe. The Jews really create the Western world, and they are therefore not just interesting or special, we really can say of them that they are unique, they are singular. There is no one else remotely like See, them. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, I, David Mamet was here who thinks about this a lot. Uh, and we had this conversation, and I said to him, you know, what it means to be Jewish, and the fact that, that I, I have such ad envy and admiration because of this sense that we are special and that we have responsibilities because of that specialness. Responsibilities to family, to faith, to the future. Right. You know, a unique sense of, of being, uh, of a unique sense of a history that has preceded you and, and an obligation to the future yes. that lies That comes ahead. out, and it comes out of that And it's part of past. one continuum. Yes. Why have Jews been persecuted so much? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons, but I suggest in the book... Um, and it takes a little while to get to this idea, but I think uh, that Jews have been persecuted by Christians at the deepest level because of God hatred. And let me Christians explain that. Christians hate God, or yeah. Un well, I think the Christians who persecute Jews, I think anti-Semites are to a large extent God haters, even though they do it in the name of some God. Exactly. But we often do things in the name of something, and we are actually doing it for another reason altogether. Right. I mean, that's a very human pattern. And uh, the, the God of what Christians call the Old Testament, or what we really should rightly call the Hebrew Bible, uh, is a demanding God, a God who doesn't let you off the hook, who insists on certain things. I think the God of the Ten Commandments is often a God who is secretly hated by nominal Christians or even Christians who are not so nominal uh, because he is a demanding God and they subconsciously associate this God with the Jewish people and I think underneath it all that's where I think at the deepest psychological level that's what's going on or that that is what has gone on. How do you think being a Roman Catholic affected the way you looked at this issue and question and story? Well, being a Roman Catholic probably f first got me to that uh, fertility festival in Ireland. <laughs> so, no fertility festival, no story. That's right. And, you know, uh, ca Catholics aren't, <clears throat> don't take guilt as seriously as uh, Protestants <laughs> and Jews do. So, uh, they don't? Uh, I don't think so, no. Uh, actually, uh, I mean, there's always the Protestant thing of, you know, because you can go to confession, you can get rid of any sin that you had that always is sort of annoying. <laughs> and Jewish guilt, of course, as we know, is a real thing. And I don't mean to slough off Catholic guilt. It's there. Uh, but it's... Uh, I I'm not sure exactly how that fits. I think that I had a Jesuit education which gave me this classical background which enabled me to connect these rural experiences with classical literature, I think that uh, I have a sense of, as a Roman Catholic, a sense of ceremony, a sense of ritual that also enables one to enter into other religions fairly easily and without being particularly uptight about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, so that may, may be of some, of some help. But, but basically, I, I, I would say that the ideas that formed both these first two books in the series really descended on me sort of out of uh, the blue. You had to write the Irish book first, though, didn't you? Well, you know why I did that? It's certainly out of, war, out of sequence. I mean, the, the Irish book really is only, takes us back about 1,500 years. This takes us back, when we begin, we begin in Sumer before the Jews about 5,000 years ago. I may be wrong about this, but you're more Irish than you are Jewish. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> uh, that's true, but, uh, but I, th I still feel myself to be part Jewish. Uh, there's no way around that. And in fact, I think we all are part of one another, that now here at the end of the 20th century, I think we have to, in a way, be able to live inside the hearts of others to find out what they're really like. Not just to be able to say, what do you think, but what do you feel? You have to be able to do that. And I think that the, the next step in, I would hope, that the, for the 21st century, we might be going toward something that enables us much more greatly to sympathize with one another than we have yeah. in the past. You want the reader to come away with what? I feel I have more than one reader. I think that I have Christian readers, Jewish readers, and So what they come away with readers. is different depending on what they brought to the table. I've tried to, I hope, talk in a way that is accessible to all three, uh, that enables, and that will enable all three to enter into dialogue. I would like to see the Western world tear down some of its unnecessary uh, walls and people in different groups begin to talk seriously with one another and to feel seriously for one another. The book is The Gifts of the Jews, How a Tribe of Desert Nomads Changed the Way Everyone Thinks and Feels, the author Thomas Cahill. We'll be right back. Stay with us.